Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News on Shri FM. My name is Beatrice Edu. The news is also live on Kesme 107.1 FM and across the world at 3news.com. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. Striking teaching staff of various colleges of education in Ghana withdraw all services following the recent directive to the Controller and Accountant General's Department to freeze their July salaries. Also coming up, Minority Caucus questions Finance Minister's revelation during the mid-year budget review that more than 2 billion cities has, been, has so far been spent on the free senior high school policy. Also coming up, terror attack in northern Togo kills several soldiers after the government reneged on negotiations with terrorists. This afternoon, we gauge the mood in communities along the Ghana-Togo border as officials beef up security. And later, high-powered government delegation visit the overlord of the Gonja Kingdom to intercede on behalf of Minister for Land and Natural Resources Samuel Abujinapo following a ban on him from visiting all palaces in the kingdom. very much for joining us this afternoon. Now, Ghana must be on high alert for possible terror attacks. That's the latest warning following yet another insurgent attack in neighboring Togo over the weekend. Two persons have died in an attack that has since claimed, uh, been claimed by a group linked to Al-Qaeda, a well-known terror organization. The recent attack becomes the second over the last six months in Togo and brings to total all three of Ghana's neighbors who have suffered jihadist attacks. Already, government has alluded to the presence of terror groupings in the northern part of the country over the last few years. But what is the picture over the last few years in relation to terror attacks? Uh, our Upper East Region correspondent Castro Senyala has been monitoring the situation around the ghana togo border and joins us live on the phone. Castro, just first tell us how residents of these communities along the ghana togo border are reacting to the latest attack in Togo. Right, this is, yes. So I have been monitoring this issue since we broke that uh, there have been there were some attacks along the Ghana Togo border and in fact uh, residents are getting scared uh, by the day considering that these attacks are happening just across the border and very close to the territory of uh, the Ghanaian territory and uh, concerns have been that yet even though the Ghanaian military and other security agencies have increased patrols and surveillance along the border or the borders of Ghana there is much uh, that is needed to be done in terms of the number of uh, officers uh, security officers or forces being posted there, and the need for, uh, I mean, these security agencies to work closely with um, uh, Ghanaian residents so that uh, they're able to trust any plan or any incident of that nature or same nature in its earliest stage. Uh, residents have also been concerned, particularly, uh, about the fact that um, the nearness or as the elections approach, they have feared that uh, it may, in a way, uh, escalate issues as far as the attacks are concerned along the borders. But they are hopeful and have placed their trust so much in the security uh, agencies, especially the military, which has always been um, doing uh, uh, patrols almost all along the border communities in the upper east region. They have the confidence in the military that they will trust and, in fact, they will make any sort of attack or plans to attack the Ghanaian territory in the bad. They are trusting the security officials, you say, but uh, have you picked information on whether or not this latest attack has affected how they, they move, as in go about their daily activities? Right, yes. So, so I've been in touch with a lot of residents, especially along the border towns that I've not been able to reach, but those that I've been able to reach, I can state uh, for a fact that this is that ongoing very well. The only thing that I have been able to monitor that is different is that since the attack happened, uh, there have been increased patrols, especially in the Baku areas, uh, where we have the Sinkasi border very, in Togo very close by. And uh, that is the only uh, new and latest development as far as it's concerned. I see a lot of uh, military officers, uh, both on bike and on vehicles, patrolling the borders, and sometimes in positions, very key positions, where they are able to detect threats from way ahead. 
Sure, before you go, uh, there are reports of some 15 people dying. Uh, I mean, different reports coming out. Are you able to confirm really the exact numbers of people who have died in this? I've been trying as much as possible to get in touch with my sources uh, as far as that uh, information is concerned. But uh, my sources, especially within the Ghanaian military and even some personnel I know across borders, haven't been able to substantiate the, uh, the facts of the information. But uh, I'm still building contact as far as it's concerned. And as and when I get details, as far as the confirmation is concerned, I'll communicate appropriately. Indeed. Thank you very much. And that was Castro Senola. He is our reporter in the Upper East region. We're joined by Vincent Azuma. He is in charge of regional... Uh, Dr. Vincent Azuma, he's in charge of uh, regional uh, monitoring and evaluation for the West African Network for Peace Building, WANAP. Good afternoon to you, Doc. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Doc, let me first find out what information WANEP has been able to pick on this. Well, the terrorist attacks in the region are almost like, almost like a daily um, occurrence in the region now, especially in the Sahel and gradually moving southwards to the borders of, in fact, in Togo, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, and also on the Ghana border. So, um, the what we've gathered so far is that there are more attacks happening and some so uh, going to happen in these three countries, Togo, Benin borders, and, uh, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Incidentally, um, somehow, because of the intelligence gathering in Ghana being heightened, um, the Ghana, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Togo borders have not seen uh, much of those experiences, apart from the, the recent one that is had. So that is what we are getting so far. Ghana has less of that threat than Togo, Benin, and Cote d'Ivoire. Mm. Uh, if you look at what is happening in Togo at the moment, for later part of last year, they had about 11 clashes with terrorist groups and with, uh, 31 dying, uh, being killed, 29 injured, with three missing, just in Togo alone at the later part of the year. So. If you look at how close Togo is to Ghana, then we should be um, thinking that Ghana should heighten its preparation um, towards um, possible attacks from the terrorists. So you've just given us the numbers there over the last months, but uh, do you have confirmation of how many people have died, for instance, in this latest one? Official figures coming out are saying, speaking, that from what we, what we are getting from the shows, uh, from our monitors, it's likely to be higher than the system that we're hearing. Uh, because um, figures coming from state sources uh, tend to um, put down the numbers to not to heighten fears of the communities. So um, our monitors on the ground in Togo and Burkina Faso are actually um, gathering the figures, and uh, within the next few hours, we should have a, a good figure to share with the public. And we know that a terrorist group attacked a military base. Are these 15, which have been confirmed, like you say, uh, solely soldiers, or they include civilians? They include civilians as well. And um, that has been the, the, the modern surprise of, 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 of the terrorists now. The first one to take out the, the military camps and uh, also get some ammunition from the military. And so apart from weakening the military at their bases, they also want to also beef up their own um, ammunition. So they attack you, the military, and then try to store some of uh, the arms and ammunition to also give up their own operation in the area. So it's been, it's been a style that they've adopted. So once they get that, then it's, it's to try to then attack the civilian population, which is a much softer target for them. You just give us the statistics as regards how bad things are getting, Benin, Togo, and all of that. Why do you think, just briefly, uh, we're getting the situation worse day by day along these areas? Well, what, what's happening is that the, the military regime in Burkina Faso has gotten a lot of support from the, um, the Russian authorities. They've actually gotten some Turkish drones as well which are very deadly, they can actually do precision uh, targeting and take out a lot of the terrorist uh, bases. So once these bases are taken off and um, the terrorists try to escape, they escape southwards. And southwards means that they are coming towards Togo, they are coming to Guinea, they are coming towards Ghana. So we are going to see a lot more of these uh, incursions by 
the terrorists that are being uh, kind of gradually being dissipated in, in Burkina Faso. Uh, we can say that um, the reports that we are getting from the authorities in Burkina Faso could be exaggerated, but the truth is that they've actually increased their targeting of the terrorist bases and try to um, weaken the terrorists. And by doing so, um, we are driving them southward. And so Ghana, Benin, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire uh, should be prepared to uh, fight these terrorists. Let me ask you one last question. I'll be glad if you're able to answer that in like 30 seconds for us because of time. Uh, I, I want to find out from you what you expect our security agencies to be doing, aside from the point you made earlier about our high level of intelligence gathering and also the report we had from our correspondent in that part of the country saying that currently there are a number of military officials patrolling these areas. Two things that Ghana needs to do. We need to um, beef up our border security. And we also need to enhance our relationship with the Tokenabe security officials and the Togo security officials as well, so that we can actually contain the situation. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincent Azuma. He's in charge of monitoring and evaluation, regional monitoring and evaluation for the West African Network for Peace Building, WANIP. Now, striking teaching staff of the various colleges of education have decided to totally withdraw all services following the recent directive to the Controller and Accountant General's Department to freeze their July salaries. The Ghana Tertiary Education Commission on July 22 instructed the Controller and Accountant General's Department to suspend the salaries of all striking CTAC members, except for the principals for July 2024. In response to this directive, CTAC in a statement says that it is withdrawing all of its services following the directive from the Ministry of Education. Uh, let's bring you uh, in the ranking member of Parliament Education Committee, Peter Nochukoto, who is demanding that the government immediately addresses the concerns of CTAC members. Uh, good afternoon to you, Mr. Nochukoto. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Mm, so you're just uh, demanding uh, the, that the government immediately addresses the concerns of CTAC members. Can you give us details as to exactly what you're asking for? Yeah, um, two days ago, uh, GTEC, that is Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, came out with a letter on the instruction of the Minister for Education that uh, control the Accountant General to not process the salaries of uh, CTAC members for July. And uh, we are of the view as a minority that this is not in good faith because it is government that has failed in its duty or obligation to take back. They won an administration uh, award uh, from the NLC last year. And that is the one man salary. Why are you refusing to pay them? Then two, there are um, allowances in areas. Why don't you pay them over the uh, period? So if for these reasons they are on strike, I was expecting government rather to take a proactive uh, a step to make sure that uh, these allowances and these uh, awards are quickly uh, settled so that they can continue to work or to resume work uh, in their various institutions. So the letter sent by the ETEC was in bad faith, and uh, I met the Minister for Employment uh, with the Chairman of the Committee, and we uh, prevailed upon him to make sure that uh, this letter is withdrawn so that the salaries of uh, CTAC members are processed for July. Because I don't think it is their fault that uh, they are on strike. Yes, it's not good to be on strike, but if you look at the circumstances, I think government has failed to honor each part of the award. Uh, that's why they are on strike. So I am urging the Ministry of uh, Labor as well as uh, Education uh, to make sure that uh, this issue is resolved. Did as you... we speak, I know... They are in a meeting, that is in a meeting with the Minister for uh, Education and other agencies to see how they can resolve the matter. And I hope this will be part of uh, the discussion we are going to have so that that letter from GTEC is revoked. Whilst we wait for the outcome of that meeting with the Ministry and CTAG uh, representatives, did you get any assurance from the Employment and Labour Relations Minister when you spoke to him about the need to withdraw this directive? Yeah, he told us that uh, if I, he did not like uh, the content of uh, the letter, and he was making sure that uh, it was withdrawn. So 
let the outcome of the meeting tell us what exactly uh, they will say. And uh, as a committee, we are also waiting for them to end the meeting today because we were also supposed to meet TikTok and uh, DPEC today. But because of the, mini the meeting with the Ministry of Education, we have uh, put our work on hold. So the outcome of uh, this morning's meeting will inform us as to what steps to take again. Mr. Nachukoto, uh, obviously you're unhappy about how the government has approached this whole issue. Is this something your committee is interested in, just even beyond this very issue with CTAC moving forward? Oh, yes, we are very much interested because last year, August, we had to prevail as a committee on CTAC to go back to work, which they did. And uh, this year, we are finding it very difficult to appeal to them to go back because if this award was uh, given last year, and the government is yet to pay them. It's unfortunate. And the issue we are more concerned now with is the migration to university salary structure. It is taking too long. And it is becoming discriminatory. So we want that area resolved as quickly as possible. So we are not happy with the delay by both government and especially the Ministry of Education uh, in that direction. So we will take it up from where they will end the meeting today. Mr. Nochikota, I want you to hold on because yesterday the finance minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, was in parliament and he told Ghanaians some things, including uh, the government's uh, uh, thoughts and policy, this policy on free senior high school. I want you to hold on, listen to him, and we'll finalize our conversation. Mr. Speaker, in 2008, His Excellency the President, then the flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party, announced the policy of free senior high school. And for eight years, he kept his conviction. On 2nd March 2017, government allocated 400 million Ghana cities to implement free senior high school. We also indicated that our oil resources will fund the program as the president believes that every Ghanaian child must benefit from the oil resources of our country. The impact of the program is evident. To date, a total of over 9.9 .9 billion Ghana cities has been spent on the program. And a relative total of have benefited from this. And you heard that the finance minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, uh, Mr. Nochikoto, you're still on the line with us. You heard him there saying 9.9 uh, .9 billion CDs has been spent so far on the free senior high school policy. But you think there's nothing significant to show for that. Any reason you say that? Yeah, um, thank you very much again. Um, what we're trying to say is that, yes, they have spent so much money. What is the outcome? We know that the numbers have increased. Have we improved upon quality of education at the senior high school level? That is one issue we need to look at critically. Uh, what constituted the 9.9 .9 billion? Is it only for recurrent expenditure or it includes uh, capital uh, expenditure? Uh, he has not told us. And that's what we are going to um, uh, query or not necessarily query. Make sure that uh, the breakdown is given us uh, in the next uh, few days as we make our comments on the statement made by the minister yesterday. Thank you very much, Peter Nochukoto. He's a ranking member on Parliament's Education Committee. And we stay on that uh, media budget review presentation by the Finance Minister yesterday and with increasing budgetary allocation to government's planting for food and jobs program since its inception, some stakeholders are now demanding an audit to determine its viability and whether it should be continued. The government launched the initiative in 2017 as a flagship project to boost agricultural production and also create jobs for the country's teeming youth. An amount of 400 million cities was allocated for the first year, and by the fifth year, the allocation had shot up to 660 million Ghana cities. As of December 2023, the government had spent a total of 2.893 billion Ghana cities on the program. However, there has not been a corresponding decline in food inflation. This has left many questioning the expenditure amidst calls 
for an audit. In his mid-year budget review, the Finance Minister, Dr. An Amin Adam, reiterated the government's commitment to the programme, which is now in its second phase. In the enhanced planting for food and jobs, this too. Through this programme, we introduced the input credit system and adopted technology-driven platforms, enabling farmers and value chain actors to operate transparently and efficiently. Mr. Speaker, enhancing fish and aquaculture production who scaled up the supply of premix fuel since January 2024. Additionally, we are also partnering with private enterprises and are providing employment to about 10,000 people to expand and venture further into agriculture. Mr. Speaker, government has been focused on expanding the economic enclave projects under the Ghana CARES program. We secure 50,000 acres of land to ensure security of tenure and various agricultural investments, thereby attracting private sector involvement in the cultivation of rice, maize, soya, poultry, grains, vegetables, and animal husbandry. At the Kusunga EEP in the Greater Accra region, Government has taken significant steps to deal with private sector operations for the cultivation of rice. And you heard the Finance Minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam. You're joined by Dr. Charles Nyaba. He's former Executive Director, Peasant Farmers Association. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Mm. And uh, let me say good afternoon to the listeners and your entire team. Mm. Doc, as the former executive director of the Peasant Farmers Association and indeed prior to that, uh, the programs manager, would you say that, that the planting for food and jobs has failed? Okay, so thanks so much. Uh, as uh, everybody asks the question, the same question we as an association also ask. If government claims to spend close to $3 billion, on the planting for food and jobs phase two, you travel across the entire country. Ask any farmer, what kind of benefit do they get from planting for food and jobs phase two? You know that uh, with the planting for food and jobs phase one, the focus was soft diving fertilizer and seed for the farmers. From 2023, government changed that to input credit. All of us were partners to the review process. We had a different consult consultative meeting with the minister and his team. We agreed that this was going to be private sector led. Government then played the facilitating role by linking the, uh, the private person with the financial institution so that they would be able to procure the input for the farmers on postponed repayment basis. In 2023, nothing happened. We used, uh, spent the whole of 2023 to do consultation. There's no farmer across this country who will say that he has received any kind of support from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. In 2024, we started again by government engaging aggregators who are supposed to take the inputs from what they call master aggregators, who are supposed to be the private person delivering these inputs to the aggregators to deliver to the farmer. We were all part of the process. We only um, were shocked that we got to know the private sector that the government was referring to is the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, uh, uh, who is now the master aggregator responsible for procuring inputs and giving to the farmers. Just last week, we were told that those inputs that the Ministry of Food and Agriculture are procuring are to be given to selected farmers. So we asked the question, who are the selected farmers? And what criteria are those farmers supposed to meet? to qualify to benefit from that. What are the other farmers? What are they supposed to do? Is that where this country has gotten to? So, Dr. Nyaba, for you, what do you think is the missing link here? Because, I mean, you're just the saying... The missing link is that the initial concept of the planting for food and jobs uh, 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 phase two was the private sector to lead in the procurement of inputs for the farmers. So now, we are not. We, we are not. Okay. We are not sticking to the original plan. That is why you think it is failing. That's what you're saying. No, this is a new plan. The new plan. The private sector is missing, and the input that the farmers are supposed to get, they are not getting it. 
The season has started. Farmers have already planted. Uh, they've already applied input. I have supplied over 10,000 uh, uh, tracts of uh, farmland to farmers across the country. When the plant of food and job phase two, the money we sell is assigned to the farmers. Where is it going? Which are the farmers who are receiving it? What do you expect the so government to do? Mm. We think that we need an independent audit to establish where this money is going to. Because usually we are very quick to say that we are spent so much. But who are the beneficiaries? That is the reason why we continue to experience food shortages and food crisis. Because uh, what the financing is meant or targeted. Those beneficiaries are not really getting it. Briefly, it's important that we to mm, briefly Dr. Nyaba, yes. beyond the audit, what else would you want to be done to improve this uh, policy or, uh, as, as it were, or program? Yes, government said it's private sector led, so private sector should lead. Wendut here. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles Nyaba. He's former executive director, Person Farmers Association of Ghana. Thank you for speaking to us. Now, this afternoon, there's a significant development from the Jakpa Palace. A high-powered government delegation is visited, visiting the Yagbongures Palace, seeking to lift the ban placed on MP for Damango, who is also Lands and Natural Resources Minister Samuel According to our sources, the delegation is to be led by the Defence Minister Dominic Nitiwo. Christopher Amako is our man there. He joins us live on the line. Christopher, what more can you tell us? We understand the Interior Minister as well as National Security Minister are part of uh, the delegation. Uh, that is exactly so. Uh, I got the uh, PR of the uh, he received a call from uh, the defense minister and also a communication was sent to the uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Christopher, I'll have to get back to you. There's some disruption in that line. Uh, but that was Christopher Mwakon. He is our correspondent in the northern region. And like I told you, there is a high power delegation going to the Japa Palace. We understand Defence Minister is part, National Security Minister Albert Kondopa, Interior Minister Henry Quarte, and also the Chieftaincy Minister Stephen Asamoabwating. We'll bring you an update of this in our subsequent bulletins as and when we have it. Now, today marks exactly 12 years to the day of the passing of Ghana's former president, Professor John Evans Atameos. On July 20, uh, 24, 2012, the nation mourned the loss of a leader whose tenure was marked by his dedication to peace, economic stability and social justice. Professor Atameos served as president from 2009 until his untimely death in 2012 as we commemorate his legacy Ghanaians from all walks of life have been reflecting on the impact of his leadership we'll bring you more later and that's how we end the news here on Shri FM our top stories Striking teaching staff of various colleges of education in Ghana withdraw all services following recent directive to the controller and accountant general's department to freeze their July salaries. You heard uh, a member of education's committee there asking the ministry to withdraw that letter or directive. We also do understand that there is a meeting of the ministry with CTAC members. We also brought you an update following a terror attack in northern Togo that has killed 15 people. My name is Beatrice Sedu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Log on to shrewnews.com for more news. Have a good afternoon. Imagine a day where the entire family will converge with music, food, family, water park enjoyment and exciting activities like water slides, go-karting, horse riding, jet skiing, canopy walk and so many games with the entire family. Welcome to 3FM's Family Fun Day at Marina Park on Founders Day holiday on August 5th, 2024 where wonder meets adventure and joy knows no bounds. Join us for a holiday of excitement with a day full of 
fun and celebration of the most precious thing of all, family, is a 3FM Family Fun Day. So mark your calendars, gather your friends and family and get ready to create a world of memories on the holiday Monday, 5th of August. Rate is 300 Ghana cities for a family of four. If it's a single adult, it's 100 Ghana cities and a child is 50 Ghana cities. Call 0532-200-927 and 0531-100-927 for tickets. Come and celebrate families on a Founders Day holiday on the 5th of August at Marina Water Park, Lakeside Estate. Don't miss out on a carnival of delight and family celebration with games, excitement and happiness for the whole family. 3FM's Family Fun Day is proudly powered by 3FM 92.7, your urban lifestyle radio. Hello there, good afternoon and welcome to Business Daily here on 3FM 92.7. Coming up, Alliance of African Multilateral Financial Institutions makes case for increase in IMF quota for member states, including Ghana. We'll hear from its president. You cannot have a, a people that control 17% of the population of the world with 5% uh, of the quota. Also, African Union invites bids for hosting of new independent Africa ratings agency set to be operational in 2025. We hear from AU Commissioner of Economic Development and Trade. By next year, the African Credit Rating Agency would be, would be operational and a few countries have come to say we are ready to host it. Plus, Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributor Seaboard urges Ghanaian investors to invest in vessels and infrastructure. Other Ghanaians can also collaborate to invest more into the vessels and the other logistics companies. Because currently we don't have Ghanaians who own those vessels to plow within the sub region So fleet charges are somehow expensive. And Michael Lubudu, I'll bring you details of our top stories and more shortly. Please stay with us. Well, thank you for your time. Shooting to our top story, the African Union is inviting bids from member countries for the hosting of the new independent Africa Ratings Agency. According to the Commissioner of Economic Development of the Union, this has become necessary to ensure true reflection of the state of African economies. Addressing the media, the Commissioner said the new ratings agency is set to be operational in 2025. We have a number of perspectives. One is for it to really start giving second opinions from the ratings from external sources. They should give a second opinion to say this is in all. Then they should also be undertaking credit rating of borrowers within Africa so that we develop an African capital market. Should also work with agencies to come up with the capacity building. So the capital across Africa who really understand the credit rating and other aspects. We also need with, to work with the governments to ensure that they call up-to-date statistics which are used in credit ratings. In quite a number of cases, we have situations that uh, where the credit rating is poor, especially at government level, because the statistics that are available, we are uh, really in high gear and we hope that uh, by next year, the African Credit Rating Agency would, uh, would be operational. And a few countries uh, have come to say we are ready to host it. Uh, we'll see how it, uh, it works out when it comes to hosting. 
So that was His Excellency Victor Harrison. He is the Commissioner for Economic Affairs at the African Union Commission. Now, away from that, Ghana, together with beneficiary African countries, have been urged to bargain with the International Monetary Fund, IMF, for an increased quota in fund allocations, according to President of the Alliance of African Multilateral Financial Institutions and Board Chairman of Afriexin Bank, uh, Professor Benedict Orama, African, Africa forms the largest population on the globe. Hence, the need to extend more aid to the continent. Are members of the IMF, so they must go and get their rights from the IMF. The only problem we have is that when they go, they must make sure that the way they treat them is the same way they treat an European country when they go to ask, just like Greece, the way they treat uh, Asian countries. That's the only thing I, I think African countries should demand. They should also demand a change in the quota. You cannot have a, a people that control 17% of the population of the world with 5% uh, of the quota of an institution that is supposed to bring stability to the macroeconomics. A part of the world that if you do indeed measure the GDP as we should, should be a behemoth in terms of economic size. So you cannot tell me, for example, not to cut the forest in DRC, but you assign no value for it when you measure the GDP of DRC. So that was uh, the president of the board chairman of the Afri Exim Bank and the president of uh, the Alliance of uh, African Multilateral Financial Institutions and board chairman of Afri Exim Bank, Professor Benedict Orama speaking there. Now to more stories and the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors Seaboard is urging Ghanaian investors to invest in vessels and infrastructure to ensure swift movement of cargo within the sub-region. According to Seaboard, this investment is crucial for taking full advantage of opportunities like the Dangote Refinery, which is in close proximity to Ghana. Speaking to the media on the sidelines of the climax of this year's Ghana International Petroleum Conference, GIPCON, CEO of Seaboard, Dr. Patrick Ofori, stated that such an intervention would reduce the cost of shipment in West Africa and boost trade. There is opportunity of collaborating and getting that, but you know, irrespective of how the proximity it is to us, it's still quoted in dollars, and this is where our ability to develop the logistics sector becomes critical. And this is where other Ghanaians can also collaborate to invest more into the vessels and the other logistics companies. Because currently we don't have Ghanaians who own those vessels to plow within the sub region So fleet charges are somehow expensive between even the west coast than maybe from Rotterdam to Accra. So until we also dare to challenge the status quo and put more investment in that aspect that has not been developed, I think we will not necessarily uh, benefit from the overall upscaling or the growth in our economy that we are seeing. So that was uh, the CEO of uh, the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributor Seaboard, Dr. Patrick Ofori, speaking there. A quick recap of our top stories and uh, the Alliance of African Multilateral Financial Institution is making a case for increase in IMF quota for member states. Uh, including Ghana and also African Union invites bids for hosting of new independent African ratings agents. But we'll go over the phone lines now and speak to Dr. Joseph Obing. He's the president of the Ghana Union of Traders Associations and speak and um, pick his thoughts on yesterday's media budget review. We've heard of a number of uh, reviews in the policies and uh, upward adjustments in some of uh, the other targets. But thank you so much for your time, Dr. Obing. Uh, first off, what do you make of uh, the presentation yesterday? Were your expectations met? Uh, okay, you know, uh, our major concerns have been the cost of doing business, the numerous taxes that we pay, and all that. And so uh, we were not expecting uh, much because in the media budget, they do not tackle the mainstream uh, budget. It's for maybe supplementary budget or uh, uh, revision uh, of uh, targets and all that. And so uh, but we have made... Uh, to understand that 
there was no uh, there was not going to be an, another tax, a new tax uh, being imposed on it, and, and that is uh, a welcome news for uh, especially the plastic industry, who um, a five percent um, uh, size tax have been imposed on, uh-huh. and then. Um, the figures as shown by the minister uh, showed uh, some positive indicators and with inflation and uh, uh, others. And then the stable, uh, the seeming uh, stability of the exchange rate. And that's what we are calling that government adopts measures um, that will help sustain these gains um, to even enhance on the value of the, uh, the local currency and then also and bring uh, inflation further down. Interesting. I'm yeah. sure you're also happy about the fact that uh, government has announced that it would be increasing its uh, uh, import cover for three months till the end of the year. I'm sure that's, that's exciting news for you. Yeah. If you look at the figures, most of the, uh, the figures are encouraging and it brings hope. But for us, what makes us even more happy is about the mitigating factor that government put in um, and for the SMEs. And so um, if these monies can be uh, directed to uh, targeted areas and then the, 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 the people that really matter uh, rather than uh, other purposes, then, of course, it's going to um, um, help mitigate some of our uh, uh, losses. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Obing. That was Dr. Joseph Obing. He's the president of the Ghana Union of Traders Associations, uh, giving us his thoughts on yesterday's media budget review presented uh, by uh, the finance minister. Some interesting figures to look out over there. Uh, overall, real GDP growth rate revised upwards from 2.8% to 3.1%. Non-oil real GDP growth rate uh, of uh, was revised upwards from 2.1% to 2.8%. And a couple of other interesting figures. We'll bring you more reactions on this and more in our subsequent bulletins. My name is Michael Lubudu. This has been Business Daily. Thank you for listening. As always, please stay safe.